in this afternoon session uh, from yes. Uh, I'm really sure that if you're not uh, really awakened, he will wake you up with the fantastic presentation he has uh, ready for us. Thank you so much for being here, and the stage is yours. talk about basketball, fiction writing, game development, and trading card games. And I will relate all of those things to software development so that they actually make sense, that it will be good. And you might be thinking like, how did we get here? Like how, why are we talking about this? And we're talking about this because I injured my arms uh, about a year ago. Um, what I was doing is, I was stressed. Um, I was being inside, I didn't do enough sports, I was playing Hades too much, and I was improperly carrying my bunnies, which is a whole other story. But the result of all of this uh, was that I had to do lots of physical exercise uh, to get my arms to work in condition again. So I needed to do exercise each day for at least one hour, up to five or six hours. Um, and that's a bit boring, <laughs> actually. Uh, so I ended up watching a lot of videos. Uh, the, the other thing uh, that it meant was I couldn't play games, uh, which is one of my favorite hobbies, uh, which you might have guessed. And I also couldn't do programming or writing blog posts. Like I do a lot of open source and everything, so it took away my two major hobbies for a year, which is really, really tough um, to me personally. And so I was, <laughs> I was quite sad. And so, you know, there's no use in being sad. Uh, so what did I try to do? I reignited my love for basketball, looked into fiction writing, game development, and trading card games. That's why I did, but while I did all of this, I could not stop thinking about programming. Because that's just who I am or how I am. I love programming too much, maybe. So I was, you know, I was watching a basketball game, I was reading up about basketball, I was like, oh, you know, there's just like this other thing in software development. Or I was, you know, playing a trading card game, I was like, oh, this relates so well to this other thing. And, you know, it just was stuck in my mind. And then at some point I was asking if I want to speak here and I submitted like three normal talks. And then I submitted an entire big section that was like, I have this weird idea in my head in case you want to hear it. And they wanted it. So that's why we're here today. Uh, this talk is titled Metaphors are Everywhere Ideas to Improve Software Development. My name is Toby. You can find me on the internet as at Fractop. I'm a senior staff engineer at Remote. Not really, I'm a staff to engineer, but I hate that name, so I choose to not use it. Uh, and Remote is uh, a company that basically allows companies to hire people from all over the world, you know, without having uh, your own uh, entity there. And in reverse also allows people from all over the world to work for companies all over the world, which is a nice mission that I really like. So, again, why, why would we do this? Why? You want to hear, you're here because you want to learn about software development and Elixir. Why the hell should you listen to me? Like, what, what's the point in all of this? Um, and I swear I have one. I have multiple, actually. Um, first of all, we're all here to learn, and looking at other fields can really help all of us learn something because it might have a bit of a different highlight. It might have something that we don't do in software development as much, but we still do. And it has been done in the past uh, as well. So I know this is a more functional <laughs> programming conference, but this is a very famous book, uh, specifically very influential in object-oriented programming, but in general, in programming. And the idea of this book, of these whole design patterns that we have, actually came from architecture. So they were seeing an architecture book of like, hey, this is how you call the room correctly, or what the hell ever else, right? And I was like, oh, we should do the same thing for programming. And so we already went to another field and learned how to do things from it and transposed it to our field. And I want to do the same thing today for many other fields. One thing that I'll say, though, is like, I don't have all the answers. Sometimes I'll just look at something and I'll be like, that's interesting. Like, they do this completely other way than us. Isn't that cool? And I'll leave you with that. And you can think about that by yourself, because I don't have all the answers. I just sometimes want to tell you this is cool and interesting to figure out. Or at least I think so. How are we going to do this? We're going to look at stuff through a different angle. Like, I won't stand here and pretend that 
software development is exactly like playing a trading card game. But I'll be like, okay, if you look at playing a trading card game through this angle or this angle, then it's like this thing, and here's what we can then learn from it. So we'll do a little example of this with basketball. So I used to play basketball um, in like very minor leagues. I'm not some big athlete or anything. And I got a new teammate one season. So that guy, he came down from the first squad because uh, he felt he wasn't playing enough. He was only playing half the game, and so he wanted to play more. He was huge. He was like 195. He had arms as big as my legs, basically. He could dunk, so like the one where he throw the ball into the hoop. Uh, so he was very athletic. He could shoot the three-point shot, which is the shot from very far away. And so he was clearly the best player. He was better than anyone else uh, of us. Now my question for you is, are we a better team with this player? Yes or no? So who thinks we're a better team with this player? Please raise your hand. Some people? OK, who thinks we are the worst team with this player? Please raise your hand. Only five, six, seven uh, brave souls. Uh, and the other ones I will, I will leave as undecided. And <laughs> so the answer is we were, uh, we were a worse team with this player. Well, makes no sense, right? He's clearly, he was better at every individual thing. We were still worse with him. How can this be? How does this happen? And the answer is quite simple. It's uh, the team chemistry. Uh, you know, he was what we call a bit of an eager player. So he would always get the ball offense and he would shoot himself or would drive to the hoop himself. And he wouldn't share the ball, he wouldn't pass to the other people. Which means that, in general, he was very exhausted because he was doing all this work, which meant he didn't play well in defense. But also the opposing team could adapt to him because they're like, okay, this guy's going to shoot anyhow, so they will focus on him and they will not guard the other people. What this also means was that the other people on the team, me included, but the others, we couldn't develop as much because you need experience, you need the ball to do something actually, to learn and get better. And because he was having the ball all the time, we didn't learn, we didn't get better, and we were also quite frustrated. We had quite some fights uh, in the locker room, actually, where you know, like, go past the ball more, and it was quite tense. So we were much worse um, as a team. And the one thing that I'll always remember about this, he only played with us one season, and at the end of the season, he came to me and he said, oh, Toby, I'm leaving the team. This is just a one-man show. This is not fun. I'll go somewhere else and do something else. He did not realize that he was the problem. He could have stopped the one-man show at any point in time. He could have just gone and be like, okay, pass the ball, involve you more. But no, instead he left. And since then, it's been a giant red flag for me when I interview people and you know they go like, oh, I was clearly the best programmer on the team. They just didn't appreciate me. I should have been promoted so many times, but ah, they just didn't appreciate me. They just didn't know. So that for me is a clear red flag that I do not want to hire this person, I do not want to work with this person because they don't value their teammates and they're probably like an ego player. So why do I think does it make sense for me to tell you this story through a basketball angle versus the software development angle? Well first, it is much, much easier to tell who's, what is winning and what is losing. It's very hard to get good metrics for software teams. Are we performing or are we not performing, right? It's very tough. But for basketball teams, I can look at the win-loss record of the team. And I can be like, this season before he joined, we were better, then we were much worse, and then we were better again. No, nothing else changed. He was the only factor that changed, but our winning percentage dropped by, I don't know, 30% or something. You know, at the season after he left, we were actually one of the best teams in the league by losing our best player. The other thing I can look at, I have very good individual statistics. Um, I can see that he scored the most points. He actually broke several league records that season. I think the one for the most three pointers made I was very proud of that. Um, but you know, I can see that in the end it doesn't help. And the other thing, or one of the major things that makes this so apparent is that in basketball, there's only one ball on offense. You know, only one player can you know, attempt to shoot the ball. And you will say now, like, Toby, that's not like that in software. I mean, we can all work on parts of the code and all of issues. But if you think about it, in my opinion, there can be this one teammate that takes all the important issues, talks all the important issues, blocks everything else, like, no, I'm going to work on this. You're not good enough to work on this. Like, let, let's wait for me to work on this. So while there's many balls, someone can still hog all the balls and therefore not let the others advance. So 
I talked to you about one type of player, which is the ego player. Let's talk about the complete opposite. Let's talk about what I call the hustle player. What does the hustle player do? It's not so active necessarily on offense, doesn't shoot the ball all the time. But what, does, what do they do? They play defense. So they defend the other team, so they keep them from scoring. They do all the small plays, so, which is also why I chose this picture, you know, jumping after the ball. You know, the ball is about to go out of bounds. You jump, you try to get it. You do every little thing that you think that will help your team to win. It doesn't even show up in the statistics or anything, but you just do everything uh, that helps you win. And the other thing that they often do is they set up others. So they play a good pass so that other people can score, or if you're familiar with basketball, they set a screen so that somebody gets open and then they can score. So they just help you try to make everyone better. Uh, around them. And maybe by the way that I talk about this type of player, you can imagine what type of player I was. Or, well, I sadly don't play anymore, but what I am. Um, this kind of player. And one time my coach came to me and was saying, like, Hey Toby, you're a glue guy. I said, What's a glue guy? I was like, No, you're not the best one on offense or anything, but whenever there's like a fight between people, you help resolve the fight. You play hard defense, you get the rebounds, you always make sure that everybody does the right thing, so you help the whole team stick together. You're the glue that helps the team stick together, and that's a glue guy. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. I was, I was very proud of that, you know, like for me, what, what counted wasn't that, you know, I scored the most points or anything, but that right there, when my teammates came, was like, this guy scoring too many points. Toby, go in the game, stop that guy from scoring points. That's what made me happy, because I realized they, you know, they respected me for what I did best, and that, that skill, although it doesn't show up, it's not in the highlights, it was respected a lot. And now why am I telling you about this again? This has a clear parallel to um, software engineering as well. So when I first attained the title of staff developer, I was looking like, what's a staff developer? What do they actually do, right? Nobody knows. And one of the most prolific pieces of writing of that that's recommended a lot is this talk by Jimmy Riley called Being Blue, uh, where she says there's this thing called blue work, which is essentially what I talked about, but you know, seeing that something is broken and going and fix that broken thing. Or well, seeing that somebody's struggling, helping that person. You now, going and cleaning up the error tracker so that we don't die of error fatigue, basically. And this reminded me of what my coach told me 15 years earlier or something, that I was, you know, the glue guy of the team. I was like, wow, this is just like what I did in basketball. I love this. This is, this is what I want to do. So I talked to you about basically two different kinds of players, the ego player and the glue guy. And now you might be thinking that, ah, you know, if I build a basketball team, I'll put all glue guys. Glue guys are the best people, you know, no, no other people. And that would be wrong because it's always about a mix and the fit of things. While I don't think that like a real true ego player is ever really good, you can have people that score a lot but you know learn to share the ball more and you can build a better team. Just you guys, you can score and you know, they also can make the team stick together because they're all already sort of like good working with each other, so there's nobody that they need to fix and you know stick together with. And so it's always a mixture that you need. You need some free point shooting, some defense. Some blue guys, some offense. And why am I telling you all about this? I don't feel like we're doing that in software development a lot. We're like, this team needs another senior developer. Cool, let's add a random senior developer to their team. We're not we're always saying, like, this team really needs someone that's really good at debugging because they're fixing really, really hard problems. So this guy that's good at debugging, you know, over there. Or, you know, why aren't we saying that, you know, we need someone that is really, really good at understanding all of these problems of this domain, let's have a developer, and maybe she's really focused about standing, understanding the domain and get in there, that has the skill of talking to the stakeholders. We're just treating every software developer as being very, very interchangeable, and I think we may be missing out on, like, building really good teams. Oh yeah, I have a lot of topics to get through, so what did we talk about for basketball? Uh, we talked about team composition right now, seeing you know, how does the team fit together, how can we best complement each other's skills, and we talked about the dangers of somebody hogging all the work and everybody just relying on them, or they're just thinking everybody relies on them. And we talked about you know, different player types, which you can maybe recognize in your software teams. Most importantly to me, we talked about being new and new work, which I hope I raised your awareness to. And I told you all of this through stories uh, that I told you. So let's talk about story writing. Like my stories were fictional. I assure you these were actual real stories. 
that I can tell you many, many more about. But let's talk, let's look at, white, at fiction writing. So, meet Brandon Sanderson. He is a prolific author, a New York Times bestselling author, has the most funded Kickstarter of all time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Point is, he's my favorite author, and he actually gives lectures on writing fiction books. Although, you know, he's so famous, he's still every year in his old university, he gives lectures, and you can watch them for free on YouTube. And that's one thing that I did while I did all my exercises. Okay, apparently that's not good to do. Uh, <laughs> um, and I just I didn't think that I would learn something from it. I just thought this was interesting and I liked the guy. He was really, really good at presenting stuff. And now you will say probably, okay, yes, Toby, we know. They write stuff, they write stuff, the parallel is obvious. And I didn't think like that because I think it's actually quite different. Um, because usually that's just a single author writing a book, right? It's not you know, a whole team that works together. And also books are written for entertainment. They have plot twists, which I love. I don't ever want to see a plot twist in code. You know, it's not, <laughs> not what I'm here for. And you know, if they forget a semicolon, you know, it's nothing bad happens. But like if I forget a semicolon in C code, you know, the compiler screams at me. And so it's it's very different things I thought. But I discovered it's actually much more alike. Because what I learned is that for instance, they do have patterns. Um, and you all know these patterns, you've heard of them. You just don't call them patterns, you call them tropes. Um, so, and that was really interesting to me because a pattern usually has this very positive connotation, like, oh, I use this pattern, whereas trope is like, oh, you're using a trope, and like, it's very bad, like, this is so tropey, I don't like it. So, I will talk about tropes for a bit, so this will be very spoiler heavy, but it is in general because, not for the stories that I talk about, because those I think you all know, so we'll talk about Star Wars, Harry Potter, and Lord of the Rings, um, so I think those are safe. But these are spoilers for every story ever, because it's how stories are constructed. So you will be spoiled in part for all stories forever. I'm partly sorry, partly not. Uh, right, so what is one of the most popular uh, tropes? The outsider. So, there's a reason why Luke lives on a farm in Tatooine and does know nothing about Jedis and the rest of the world as a main character. And why is that? so that we can introduce, alongside our main character, Luke, we can be introduced to the world. We learn about the world as they learn about the world, so that we can have a slow world building, so that it's not weird that they don't know what Jedi are or what not. And it's the same with Harry Potter. He doesn't grow up in the wizarding world, so that he can learn about the wizarding world. It's the same with Frodo living in the park post nowhere, and then, you know, going like, oh, there's actually all of these things happening. This is why that's happening and why people use this. So, tropes aren't always bad, right? They just need to be used right. And the next trope that really relates to this is the trope of the mentor. So there's a reason why we have Obi-Wan Kenobi, the thing goes like, oh yeah, you know, this is Jedi, and you know, you need to know all of this. And the reason why, you know, we have Gandalf and we have Dumbledore to teach them all of these things. And there's a reason why they all die or disappear. Because if they've been there all the time, they could just fix all the problems by themselves. You know, like Obi Wan Kenobi could just go like, I do all of this. Dumbledore could do all the things, and they also need to learn. You know, when the mentor goes away or dies, this is a big growing moment for the main character. So this is why all of this happens, and it exists also in the lecture. That's why Brent Simmons says, like, I was not surprised that you know Dumbledore died because he had to die. This is how this works. You know, so now you know this as well. So why well, am I telling you about this? It is very important for the tropes that we need to know why and when to use them. They're very tied to this. Like we like we think they're kind of bad, but we know why we use them, and then they're good or they're okay. And I think we have the opposite relationship to like some architecture patterns or to some design patterns. We're like, oh, cool, you use microservices. That's awesome. We don't go like, oh, you needed to use microservices. What are the specific problems that drove you to make this decision? Um, we don't do that. Same thing with design patterns. And the sad part is that actually the original design patterns book that has all when should you use this in there, but I don't think we focus too much on that. I mean, not everybody, I know there's lots of people that are critical of design patterns and also microservices, but I feel as a general notion in the industry, I don't think we look at this enough. So, another part in which fiction writing is very, very similar to what we do is world building. They need to create these entire worlds out of nothing. 
And we do partly the same. Like usually the worlds or the systems that we create are some approximation of reality, but we still create them and we need to make sure as today that they are logically consistent. Like everything needs to fit together. Like you can't be like, oh, one time you tell them, oh, the force, I don't know, you can use it to push objects. And then the next time tell them, no, the force can only be used to, I don't know, make it rain or something. It needs to fit together, it needs to all be logically consistent. As a result of this, they're actually bugs in books, believe it or not. Um, there's a very famous example where George R. R. Martin once misgendered the horse of Jamie Lannister. And then people were going mad because they were like, okay, is this really Jamie Lannister? Why is he kidnapped? And is it different? It, it, it's like a hint, a foreshadowing from George R. R. to tell us that you know, it's not really him or his horse died on the way or something. And he just made a mistake. That's, that, that's just what happened. But because people are so used to like looking forward to foreshadowing, they need to like, no, no, that was my mistake, sorry. And so they really need to make sure that they don't mess these things up. And the interesting question now is like, how, how do they do this? And I found this quite interesting. Um, first of all, there's this completely different job that we don't have in software development, which is editors. Editors basically just read the story and then they say, this one isn't interesting enough, or there's logical inconsistency here. They're basically professional code reviewers. That's what they do. They don't write books, at least most of them. They just read them and just say, this book is good, this, good, this book is bad, you need to change this in your book. And we don't have that job. I mean, I sometimes feel like I have that job, because sometimes for weeks on end I will review pull requests and stuff, and I don't write any code. Um, but generally speaking, we do not have this job. And I'm like, should we have this job? Should we have somebody that is just really, really good at code reviews? Because clearly, some people are better at code reviews uh, than others. Um, as a result of all of this, books also go through many major revisions, which now, I mean, I feel like I was dumb, and it's like, of course they go through revisions, but before I watched the lecture, I was like, okay, they just write a book beginning to end, and, it, and it's done. And that's not how it happens. Uh, so for instance, Brent Sanders in each book goes through five or six revisions, Sometimes very major ones where he moves entire parts around or removes them or he figures out they don't work. And, I don't know, for me this was very, very interesting uh, to find out. Um, there's also a thing called writing groups, where basically people, they all write a book, they get together, and then they exchange chapters of their respective books, read it, and then they get feedback from the others. So it's basically like a big code review of many people. And what I found really interesting there is that Brendan Sanderson gave a very strong word of advice to not take every piece of feedback literal and implement it. He was saying that, hey, this is your story, you know your story, you know what you want to achieve with it. You know, don't let any piece don't let every piece of feedback get in there so that you just implement it. Think about is this really the right thing for me? And I sometimes believe we're sometimes too easy to just implement whatever feedback we get on a pull request uh, review. We're just like, okay, whatever, you know, the reviewer says this, so I'll change it. But the reviewer might not know this piece of code and this problem as well as we did, because, you know, we worked on it for many, many days. And sort of like, I mean, one person here works with me, but not directly with me. If you work with me, I leave a ton of comments on pull requests, even if I accept them. I'd be like, this is great, we can merge it as is. Ten comments from Toby. <laughs> completely normal. <laughs> That's completely normal. And I have this one really, really great uh, colleague, uh, lady, and they're really good at just saying, like, no, Toby, this is not important right, enough right now, or they're like, okay, Toby, I did this because of this and this reason, so, like, I will not implement your suggestion. And I love Eleni for that, because, you know, I don't write all of these comments because I want my comments to be implemented. I write them because I want to understand the code, and I want to share thoughts and ideas, and I want to align on what do we want to achieve, where do we want to go. And I think we should really do you know, more of that. And last but not least, for this, authors make spikes. And this kind of blew my mind a bit. So what is the spike for an author? Uh, they have a character, but the character doesn't feel right. They can't figure out the character. So what they do is, they for instance write a monologue of that character for like 10,000 words or something. Just what would this character say and everything to just get a feel for the character. They will then throw away this monologue. This is just done so that they can feel out what is this character like. And that reminded me that I don't know when was the last time that I wrote an actual spike to see like what actually happens with this code and then throw it away. I 
actually can remember. And I think maybe I should do this uh, more often, or like we should do it more often. But anyhow, in his lecture, Brent Sanderson, he also created Sanderson's Laws, which are free, and I don't have the time to talk to you about all three, but I think all three of them are interesting. I'll just tell you about Sanderson's second law. And his laws actually relate to magic systems, which he likes. And he says, the limitations are more interesting than powers. What does he mean by that? If I tell you a story about someone who can fly, it's like, okay, somebody can fly, that's, that's a story I've heard about that, it's okay, not so interesting. Now, I pitch you a different story. Somebody can fly, but only while their parents are asleep. And you're like, oh, that's weird, but that's okay, how would this work? Like, what can you do? Like, how would they work with these limitations? And now we have a more interesting story that revolves around these limitations. And generally speaking, you need those limitations to make it interesting because also if the power has no limitations, you can just solve every problem, you know, by the power, you know, bam, it's there. How does this relate to software development? I think that when we pitch new technologies, I think we only look at the powers. We don't look enough at the limitations in, you know, conferences like this one, but also in general. So for instance, one thing that is very popular in the online community is, you know, hot coach deploys, you know? It's like, wow, I can do this, I can deploy things and I don't need to have no downtime and it's really, really cool. And then you look into what is actually required to make this work and you're like, oh wow, every module call to every other module needs to be, you know, needs to be backwards compatible with the old version of this data and the module and it's just a giant piece of work that almost nobody wants to do. Like, if you really, really need and want to do it for a specific system, you can do it and it's great. But do you want to do it for normal deployment when you can just get away with out of these limitations and you just want to do it? Probably not. And that's something that I look at more these days. It's like, oh, we can solve this problem with microservices, okay. Yes, microservices helps in this way. But what do we need to invest to actually make this work? What are the limitations? What are the work that we put on ourselves? And I really like to think about new technologies or proposals more in that direction. Let me leave you for this part with one last consideration which is, in the fiction writing world, uh, handing over works happens very, very rarely. Like, you can very rarely see that like an author goes like, oh, I don't want to write this book anymore, this book series. You go write it. That only happens usually when an author dies. And so that's how Brendan Sanderson finished The Wheel of Time and did a good job at it. And it's very rare that people do it, and it's very rare that it ends well. Because they have all this context in, in their heads of like, how are all these things working together. So it's really, really tough. We do this all the time. Like, we change jobs and we try to continue someone else's vision all the time, all day. And that's just normal in our industry. And this is one of the places where I don't have an answer. I'm just like, this kind of sucks. You know, like, it would be better if it would be other ways. But, you know, there's reasons for it. And I don't know. I, I think we also don't talk enough about, like, how hard this actually is. Oh, yeah. Anyhow, we talked about uh, fictional writing. And most of all, we talked about the app use of patterns and why we should have a clear why and when for them, uh, such as the limitations that I was just talking to you about, as well as the overall logical consistency of everything that's involved that we want to keep with certain strategies, and that we want to carry on a vision of what we want to do, and that it's hard if you know people change jobs all the time. Something else that needs a lot of vision is, you know, developing games. And so, I watched a lot of game documentaries. So there's this cool YouTube channel, like no clip documentaries. And uh, they're about how games are made for like games like Hades, which I love, but also Rise of the and like more popular games. And you can watch it for free on YouTube as well. There's a link in the slides. And one thing that I learned there is also about like this vision for things. So Hades is a game where you play the sun of Hades and you battle your way out of hell to the surface in search of your mother. The original pitch for the game was much different. So this is Theseus and the Minotaur and they're actually the boss of the third act of Hades and they're very annoying, very, very annoying. The original pitch was that Theseus was actually the hero that you were going to play and the Minotaur was the final boss. Now they're together one boss in the game and you can see that really shifts the tone of the entire game and what is important in games is that this whole vision needs to be really consistent so you need to have the art style, the music, 
the narrative, the game design, they all need to work together perfectly to make a game work for you. And this kind of vision is something that we often have in companies, but I don't think we have it enough to a certain extent. And the other thing that I really think about is that the vision really helps the collaboration. So something that's very common in more artistic endeavors like game development, but also, for instance, uh, I know from the enemies covered with people, um, is that, for instance, the music, like the person who writes the music will look at the art to inspire the music. The artist will listen to the music and create the art while listening to the music, so they all inspire each other. And I don't know, what was the last time when you got together with your UX designer, your product manager, and whatnot, and you really talk to each other, you talk about each other's vision, and that really changed the vision for where your product or that piece will go. And I can't remember the time. I mean, we're sure we adjust course, but we don't work as closely together across all the disciplines. Or when was the last time you talked to sales? And sales was like, oh yeah, all this fails all the time. And like, like, oh, we need to take the whole product in a different division. Uh, different division, different vision, so different direction. And the other thing that I found very interesting, uh, especially at Supergiant Games, once a month is playtest day, and everybody, everybody in the company, no matter if sales or QA or programmer, plays the game for 90 minutes, and then you all get together and gather feedback. Again, this is something we don't do often enough. Like we often work in our small teams with one specific piece. In my case, payments. I'm always joking. I'm sitting in the cellar and just writing XML files all day. That's my job. Um, but you know, we lose touch to the actual application, to what is the actual end user experience like, and like lots of people do that. Maybe developers, sales, lots of people. And I think this is something we should do more. We should know what the application looks like and what we can do with it. And another thing that it's actually the entire reason, probably, why I have the GitHub section in here. This is Amir Rao, he's the studio director at Supergiant Games, who made 80s. And he was talking about how for him, basically, every one of the games is a reaction to the last game. So, they first made Bastion, which was kind of like a fantasy action game. They said, like, oh, we want to do something more sci-fi with a love story, but also sort of like more tactical turn-based combat. So, they made Transistor. After Transistor, they felt like, oh, we want to do something with way more characters. So, they made Pyre. And Pyro only came together in the last, you know, three, six months of development that was playable. So we're like, ah, oh, this was so exhausting. Let's make a game where it's really action-oriented and we can have a playable prototype within the first couple of months and then we can play and, you know, iterate on it. And so they made Hades. What does this have to do with anything? Um, I looked at this and I thought, like, for me, every one of my jobs is a reaction to my last job. You know, like, I was at a job, it was fucking sexist, I hated every second of it, and so I left, and so in my interviews, I made very, very sure that the next company I would end up with wouldn't be sexist. And then, you know, I worked at a company where the values of the company were really abused to really shut you up. And so I tried really hard in the interviews to listen for, like, what are actually the values and the culture in this company so that the same thing doesn't uh, happen to me. And that really helped me think about my own job history and why I choose certain jobs, but it also helps me, you know, look at applicants. And I'll be like, okay, like, what is it that you, it feels bad to say, but what is it that you're running away from? And will you have this thing here so that you will be happy here? Um, yeah. So, we just talked briefly about game development. Um, we talked about, I actually can read this, I hope you can read it. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, every game is a, every job has a reaction to the last job. And vision and collaboration. So let's talk about maybe what is the weirdest thing that I'll talk to you about, at least in my estimation, is card games. So what the hell have card games to do with you know, software development or companies? First, you have a deck. You can think of this as your tech stack or your company. So I have a couple of staff developers in my deck, I have a Postgres SQL in my deck, and I have Alex here in my deck. And this is you know, how I want to play, this is how I want to solve problems. I also have like remote in there because I want to work remotely. Um, then I have my hand and my mana, which is basically these are the resources that I have at hand right now, and I need to pay these resources to maybe you know deploy my staff developer and my Postgres SQL to solve the problem. And then the other cards that you've already played that are in play and playing against each other, you can think of your own cards as sort of like the practices that you implemented and or you know the people that you have, and they're fighting against you can say either the competition 
or against a problem that you're trying to solve. So for instance, I deploy my staff developer and my PostgreSQL to write a very good business uh, report, and the business report is then the problem that I try to fix. I know it sounds kind of esoteric, but it makes a lot of sense, at least in my head. And I hope it does at least a little bit for you as well. So if we think about software development or playing card games like this, what can we learn? A very intrinsic part of playing these games is deck building. So you will always build a new deck and you'll be like, okay, what can I do? The first thing that you always think about is how do I win? What is my win condition? What can I do? And again, I don't think we do this enough. Usually when we start like a new thing, we're like, okay, I like Alex your Phoenix and Postgres, so that will, this will be my stack, it will be fine. But you don't think about like in, I think often enough detail, like how does this actually win me this? Like how am I making a better job here with this tech stack than with any other tech stack that I could choose? Specifically, the other thing that you think about is what are my matchups like? So, which is like, I play against these other decks, how do I match up with them? Like, what, how can I exploit them or how do I win against them? And so we also, I think don't do this enough. It's like, okay, I built this thing, I will face these problems, I'm sure. If it was like, I don't know, high load, I will need to build very, very complex reports. How, in my tech stack, how do I solve this and how do I solve this really, very, very well? And then, when you build your deck, a common mistake that people do is they're like, okay, I'm really, really good with big creatures, so I'll just put in more big creatures. And that is usually the wrong thing, because if you're already really, really good with that, you're good with that. Uh, the problem is more like your deck might have weaknesses in certain matchups, and you want to patch up those weaknesses. So, for instance, if I have a really good tech system, and all my types are working fine, I don't invest more time in making an even better type system and make my types even better, because maybe I have a problem with lots of connection errors or time errors. I should rather focus my time and my energy and like implement something or have something in my deck that can deal with time errors and connection errors better rather than making good what I'm already really, really great at. And at the same time, in deck building, you always look for synergies. How do these cards work with each other? For instance, if I want to work remotely, that's great, but I shouldn't play the cards that require synchronous communication because if I'm distributed across the whole world, I can't get all the people into the same room or in the same online meeting all the time because of time zones. It will be very hard and we can't do it. So that's why we should, for instance, use asynchronous communication if we, go, if we work in a globally distributed remote team. And so, because these actually synergize with each other, whereas uh, remote and synchronous communication don't uh, synergize with each other. When playing games, then, something that is very important is tempo versus value. So you can basically, you can play cards very fast, and then you have something that frightens your opponent, basically, and they have to react to it. Or you can play something that generates value over time, so something that makes one of your creatures one power stronger or something every minute, something like that. And I feel that especially startups should play tempo all the time. They're like, okay, implement this feature, implement this, implement this, implement this. And at some point, we run all of resources and, you know, we're just out. Whereas it might have been better at an earlier point in time to do something that would really help us make everything else stronger and better. We rarely take that time to really play for value versus tempo. And the other thing that really fascinates me about trading card games is the meta. What's the meta? The meta is what decks are currently being played. So what is everyone doing? And this is always influenced by new balance patches. So for instance, if now Alexia comes up with a new type system, that's a massive balance patch for Alexia, because now we have a working type system that we can use, which is really, really uh, great. So in that way, it exists for us as well. The other thing that happens in the meta is that you form an anti-meta. So for instance, everyone builds single page applications, and then VHH will come around, it's like, no, server-side rendering is the best, and so there will be this anti-meta which completely opposes what is currently being done. A good example of this is that I don't have time to go into it in detail right now, but basically it was a balance patch that made the upper graph dragons much, much better, um, and so everybody was playing that. But at the same time, the other people were going like, oh, everybody will be playing dragons, so I'm going to play Lurk, because Lurk is very good against dragons, and so then people play for Lurk, and this is how the meta balances out over time. And it's very important for me to say that, you know, the decks in the meta are necessarily the best decks. They're just the best decks in the current circumstances and against the current, so basically, problems that you're facing. 
So why is it interesting to look at card games? It's very simple. They get balance patches on new cards very often, so like every couple of months, and then trying out a new deck takes like a couple of days, not years. Like trying out a new text deck to really know what's up, you gotta work in it for a couple of years. And we don't get new ones so frequently. And that's why I think it's very interesting to look at the whole deck building aspect for card games because it's just done much more often because how often do you really build a new text deck? So this was card games. Um, we talked about deck building, we talked about the meta. And now you go like, okay, Toby, you told us four completely different stories. Why is this one talk and not four talks? And quite honestly, I can't do four full-length talks about this. I just tried to condense it into one talk, which was a very bad idea on my end, but it's not your fault. But I swear I also have a point with this, which I'll take just two minutes more, I'm very sorry, uh, to talk about this. So you might think that all of this is completely separate. It has no overlap whatsoever. And you would be wrong. The meta exists everywhere. We just don't call it the meta. So in basketball, for instance, uh, the play style has changed over the time. Uh, we used to have very big, strong guys that just stand underneath the basket and score. Now it's a league dominated by small players that shoot three-point shots from way outside. The complete play style has shifted. And with it, also the players and the player types uh, that are valued. Writing styles have shifted as well. Fantasy stories aren't about gnomes, dwarves, and elves anymore. They're about very, very different things these days. And the same thing in game design. Uh, the patterns that are applicable in games right now are much, much different. And for a time, all games got a lot easier all the time. But then Dark Souls came around, and suddenly games were hard again. It was cool to have hard games again. And so the meta has also shifted in that direction. And yeah, it applies to all of this. And you know, our meta has also shifted. We have multiple now. We, it's, it's very different. And this applies to everything. Same thing for making things fit together. You know, we talked about this in the terms of basketball player fit. But for a story, you need your characters, your settings, and your plots to fit together to form a coherent narrative, a coherent good story. For games, as I talked about, you need to have the gameplay, the narrative, the sound, and the graphics fit together so that it's one current unit again. And deck building is, I think, I talk a lot about, you know, patch up your weaknesses, synergies, so this is a lot about this fit. So, what am I telling you? I try to tell you, tell you that more things are connected than I think we often think they are. Like, we think we have all these separate things and they have nothing in common. But I actually think that if each one of you looked at your favorite hobby, you can find at least one thing or two things, how they relate to software development or your day job, and how they could actually make it better at your day job. And that way you can transfer knowledge from lots of places to other places and actually be better at them. And I think that's really interesting and cool. So there's a reason why we have all of this metaphors. So I want to leave you with all the learnings that I hopefully gave you, but I also want to leave you with this one little task. Look at your hobbies and see what you can learn from them to do uh, better in software development, and maybe also we can talk about that. So, thank you. My name is Toby. It may be a mistake to ask this if you have a few minutes. But, uh, I find that the, the, the game side, like game developers, think and speak more about like, these things and, and, and design and currents. Why do you think we don't speak that much? Why, I, I guess you know who Jonathan Blow is and that kind of talks. The, the who? Sorry. Jonathan Blow? Uh, no, I don't know. Sorry. No? Well, you will see some videos <laughs> this week. So why, why do you think, like, I guess you have seen many game designers speaking about the design and high level and how all these concepts. Why don't you think we speak more about that? Why is it a culture thing? Uh, it's a very good question. So the question, if I understand correctly, is like, is it, there's a lot of game design, what makes good designs, and what makes a good game, and we don't talk a lot uh, about that. And I think it's cultural in the sense that, like, we have this very big culture of we're all just developers and we develop something. And whereas game design is a very specific profession, like that's like you take a course to be a game designer, you don't even know how to program, but you learn this, you study this uh, in detail. Um, and 
we just we just don't do it to that uh, certain extent, and then you can say like, okay, maybe it's the architects, but then with the architects with the problem, they don't actually code, so that's why we pull them back to the code. And so it's um, it's one thing that would be also fascinating because like when you look at game development, it's also heavily specialized. You know, they just don't take every scene to when you go in. There's like there's game engine developers, then there's environmental developers, there's you know graphic developers, there's gameplay developers, there's like there's all these different things. It's completely different uh, specialization. So I think they're all very much specialized and I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing actually. So another question. I hope that's halfway out of it.